final day in Johannesburg. And what a day it promises to be. The great Iwiza Kaiser Chiefs are to play African Wanderers. Substitute Wembley for Johannesburg, and occasions like this were the start of my lifelong addiction to sport. Go on, good people, go on! The noise, the crowd, the physical excitement, the smell of food stalls. The furtive asides of the ticket touts, all pure theatre. And here, my South African friends promise me it will be like it used to be in Britain. No aggro, no violence, either on or off the pitch, and good football. I notice there's a big police presence, but there is in our cup final too. No, this is going to be a sporting event, they tell me, as colourful, as spectacular as any in the world. What's more, they say, the teams are integrated here in South Africa, the home of apartheid. The spectators too, gone are the segregated stands of yesterday. And yesterday was such a short time ago. There it is. Remember that explosive event in 1968, the Dolivera Affair. Basil Dolivera, classified in his native country, South Africa, as a coloured man, had scored a resounding 158 for England in the fourth test against Australia. His place in the next test series against South Africa seemed assured. And then came the bombshell. The MCC selection committee dropped him. Dolivera's dream to play test cricket in the country of his birth was shattered. Cricketers, at least most of them, were angry. So this was how the MCC treated a so-called coloured player when confronted with South Africa's apartheid laws. Laws that prevented white and black playing together. Pressure mounted, both within and outside the MCC. With the injury of one of its players, Dolly Vera, at the 11th hour, was included in the team. It was now the South African government's turn to be outraged. At Bloemfontein, to tumultuous applause, Prime Minister Forster spelt out their position. The team as constituted now is not the team of the MCC. It is the team of the anti-apartheid movement. The result was Dolly Vera didn't come, and neither did the MCC, and they haven't come since. That was 15 years ago. Earlier this year, to the astonishment of the world, it was a West Indian team of men much blacker than Dolly Vera who came out onto the field at Newlands, Cape Town to play the South African Springboks. They were given an ecstatic welcome and an average of £33,000 each by the South African Cricket Union with the offer of any losses to be underwritten by the government itself. An offer that, in the event, was not needed. Some truly amazing changes had taken place, it seemed. I think South Africa is changing in a... In a, in a solid way, in a, in, a, in a deep thinking way. We aren't going willy-nilly into the thing because the rest of the world says, you do this or else. Look, I was born in this country and I'm not prepared to just give my country over to any race or any crowd because where the hell must I go? If feelings run high in the whites-only men's club of a small Karoo town, so they do too in the Shabins, the pubs of Soweto. The black men is, 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 like, is like people trapped in a ship, and the ship is about to sink. Black and white, green and yellow. We are prepared to sink with the ship because there is no better world for us until our authorities in Pretoria listen to us. Well, it does seem that in sport at least, the authorities have been listening, or at least reacting. And the reason? In South Africa, I've hardly met a sportsman who didn't acknowledge that it's the boycott. South Africa's stage-by-stage -stage exclusion from most international sport that has provided the catalyst for this. 
It's a boycott that has become the cause of deep bitterness and frustration to some black sportsmen as well as white. President of the South African Olympic Association, Rudolf Oppermann. The way the world sees fit to use sport to indicate their displeasure with apartheid or the worst elements of what is remaining of apartheid. And to me, that is an absolute abuse of sport which should, and the British told us that, that sport should be played for the sake of sport and not to be abused for political ends. It's not just Rudolf Oppermann and other sports administrators, but the South African government itself, who are now engaged in a no-holds-barred campaign to break that boycott. Sport in the Republic, they argue, is already integrated. And where the laws of apartheid might otherwise prevent this, sport has been granted special exemptions. It is free to go its own way. Now, you may not approve of or believe in boycotts, but let's be absolutely clear why South Africa is banned from international sport. It's not banned because of its record on human rights, for we play sport with countries that have a far worse record. Countries like Chile, Argentina and the Soviet Union. No, they are banned by sport itself and they are unique for being banned in that way and have been since 1970. Simply because sport is based on the ethos of play and competition being fair and equal for all. Opportunities have to be fair and equal for all. And that is not deemed possible in this country which practices apartheid. Now, since 1970, there have been many efforts to break the sanctions on international sports movement. Sportsmen have been coming here as teams or purporting to be teams, and there have been considerable inducements to bring them here. On the other hand, there have been a lot of changes within sport, a lot of people trying to uh, show the international world of sport that the changes have been brought about. What we have to examine, are those changes basic and fundamental, or are they merely cosmetic? Indeed, to use that much repeated phrase, is normal sport possible in an abnormal society? It was just 10 years ago that a black and white boxer were allowed to fight each other on South African soil for an international title. Since then, to bring home to the outside world this integration at the top, South Africa has paid considerable sums of money to persuade mainly black American boxers, boxers like John Tate, to come and fight one heavyweight hopeful after another. Here, Harry Kurtzia. Champion on the scale. But now, given the chance, black South African boxers are increasingly dominating the scene, with promoters, both black and white, naturally putting their money where the talent is. Challenger on the scale. At the Mid-City Gym in Johannesburg, I talked with Dr. Wilf Rosenberg, a dentist by training, who came to the fight game after playing Springbok rugby and rugby league for Leeds. I think anybody who had lived in South Africa in the 50s and the 60s and left South Africa and then returned in uh, the 70s and particularly now coming into the early 80s would have seen um, unbelievable changes. Many of them wouldn't recognize the country, although there are many things wrong and we'd be fools to deny this. Yet there are changes taking place and I believe we are moving forward in the right direction, particularly this present government. Not everyone shared this upbeat view of the situation. I asked Harold Pongolo, boxing correspondent of the Rand Daily Mail, about facilities in the black townships. Well, they are appalling. Facilities are appalling because you will find there is only one gymnasium, at least a decent gymnasium, in the sprawling Soweto, which has got uh, over one million inhabitants. Boxers have always had to survive with lousy facilities. It's part of the tradition, made familiar in many a B-movie. Nothing was going to surprise me, I thought, not even in Johannesburg's dormitory town for blacks, Soweto. What I saw, though, was rough. So this is it, Joe, boxing Soweto style. That's right. One tilly lamp. On punching bag. Is that, is that really typical? Well, this is most of it, 95%. Joe Gamedi, a Damon Runyon-like figure who follows the fight game in London and Las Vegas. You as a promoter, you travel around and you see facilities like this the whole of the time. You're picking up boys out of this sort of facility. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All over, not only Soweto, but just but all over South Africa, it's more or less like that. What astonishes me is there's, there's not even a semblance of a boxing ring. 
How do they learn their craft in the boxing ring? Well, when they get to the ring, they have to learn about it. We found out what that means for a professional in Daviton, another black township, where facilities were at least a little better. Job fighting Zulu is a bantamweight. He's three days off his fight with an upcoming contender for the South African title. Since his purse for that will be just 50 pounds, he still keeps his regular job as a messenger. Who gave, who gave you the name Job Fighting Zulu? Is that your name? Yeah, no, the, the, stable, the stable mate gave him the name. You know, don't you miss the fact that uh, you haven't got a real boxing ring? I'll never, I'll never lose it. Right? Never use one for training? <laughs> With the corner of the gym as a changing room, a window latch for his clothes and no shower, this was certainly not the facilities I later saw for white boxers. A short time ago, all the well-equipped training centres, with one notable exception, were strictly for whites. Nowadays, most of these places, though certainly not all, are open to blacks. But conditionally, not of right. Usually, for a black to have access, he has to be part of a stable, for someone to have a vested interest in him. Francie Badenhorst is job-fighting Zulu's opponent for Friday night's fight, an Afrikaner who, before turning professional, worked as an apprentice welder. Well, how are these young fighters fair tonight in Madison Square Garden, Kwatema Township? Theirs is not a top of the bill fight, but they're both good boxers, and whoever wins will get a crack at the Transvaal title, and then, who knows, maybe the South African. William 51,70 kilograms, Franz Barinost. And on my left, in white and black trunks, weighing 52,40 kilograms, Chop Zulu. A decade ago, a fight like this was not just unthinkable to most South Africans, it was forbidden by law. Watching these two well-matched boxers, this fight could be taking place in Mile End or Moss Side. So, OK, it's watched and closely controlled, but one has to admit that changes have been made. Why then question the changes? In the years I've been coming here, there have been many, and they appear significant. But if you dig a bit deeper, there is another side to it. Freeze this image, add the caption, this is how we discriminate in South Africa, and you have one of the government's most effective overseas advertisements. It implies that black and white meet on equal terms. But is it equal? <laughs> to answer that, you must put the suspended image into a wider context. For a start, professional boxing may be integrated, but at the amateur level, which after all is the seed bed for any professional, it's still segregated into white, black and coloured organisations, with glaring disparities in terms of their access to good facilities. Would a fairer distribution of facilities be the answer then? No, the heart of the matter is nothing to do with equal access to boxing rings. Sadly, as I watched this fight, I was still remembering an incident on the way here. Our film crew had stopped off for a quick coffee at a local wimpy bar with boxing promoter Joe Gamede. After a few minutes, the young white waiter came up and in some embarrassment asked Joe to leave. Why? Because two young white customers had objected to his presence and by law, the waiter was obliged to respond to their complaint. It's difficult to remain impartial when confronted by things like this. Here was a good friend forced to leave a scruffy looking wimpy bar in some one horse town because two young lads had complained. It simply makes you wonder how many times a day is job fighting Zulu reminded of his separate and inferior status. How many times is his confidence as a boxer and as a man undermined? 
That the black boxer is getting to the top is certain. What happens to him on the way there is the question. For the winner of the last bout on points, Franz Barinos. Harold Pongala was at the fight, covering for his newspaper. I remembered something he'd said to me. When you build a house, you don't start with the roof. You start with the foundations. It has to be at grassroots level. You have to find, get schools mixing together and so that they grow up to understand each other. There is no point that you have to train in best facilities in the city and then go back to the ghetto in the dark city. If you can play together, why can't you live together? Living together is one of the things you can't do in South Africa. 25 miles and a world away from the dark city is the Wanderers Club. It is undoubtedly one of the most splendid and well-appointed sports clubs in the world, and one in which I've always been made very welcome. It is situated in Johannesburg's rich northern suburbs and has facilities for more than a dozen sports up to international standard. When they bring the foreign journalists here, and along with visiting sports delegations, they usually do bring them here, club officials point with pride to the fact that this very prestigious club now has 20 blacks amongst its 14,000 members. Also, a black school has been given permission for some of its students to come here and do their athletics training. Among them, Catherine Umvelazi. The school is the Minerva Secondary, and it's situated in the black township of Alexandra. Even if it's quite a bus journey for Catherine, access to the Wanderers is seen as a great opportunity. There's certainly no such facilities in Alexandra. Alexandra Township, population 75,000, is right in the heart of Johannesburg. And because of this, it's been an embarrassment to the government. Like District 6 in Cape Town, they wanted to get rid of it. That it has remained is an extraordinary anomaly. Because the policy these days is to get black townships well away from where white people live. It's all part of what is called the Group Areas Act, where people in South Africa, classified black, white, coloured and Indian, must live in strictly separate areas. This is one of the laws of apartheid. Louis Ciecho is 17 and also trains at the Wanderers. He plans to be a civil engineer. He is confident and ambitious, a young man destined to go places. His mother keeps a neat and proud home. Without plumbing and electricity, that's not always easy. Inevitably, all Louis's school friends are black. If he were to make friends with any of the white athletes at the Wanderers Club, he couldn't invite them home. Or if he did, they would have to get a permit and have good reasons other than just friendship to come here. It's bald facts like this that leave a lot of people unimpressed with what's happening at the Wanderers Club. Headmaster of one of Johannesburg's coloured schools is Reg Feldman. What is happening at the Wanderers is in the nature of a gimmick. And uh, it is also dishonest. Because to anyone coming from outside, they gain the impression that this is a normal thing going on amongst uh, athletes and that it happens all the time in South Africa. There's no doubt it's very difficult to have any proper integration at club level when the different races are forced by law to live in separate localities. Most black sportsmen I've met hate it, but not all. Kenny Jacobs is one of South Africa's finest long-distance runners. He's officially classified not as a black man, but as coloured, a person of mixed race. He therefore lives in a specially designated coloured area and works as a canteen manager at one of the big gold mines. He knows he's in a privileged position as an athlete, but doesn't he question the government's right to determine where he may or may not live? This separation doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me because I've grown up like that. I've grown up on the black side and they've grown up on the white side. 
like for instance, the Group Area Act. Actually, that it sued. It sued the black men. It really sued the black men. It's doubtful if it's a view shared by the average mine worker. These are men who, unlike Kenny Jacobs, don't go home of an evening to their wives, kick around a football with their kids, or take their place as men in normal society. Because separating them are another set of apartheid laws that keep their families in so-called homelands hundreds of miles away. But if the gold mines are certainly no place for a man to spend the best years of his life, that's the way, that's the way. they nevertheless provide one of the few opportunities for a black person to effectively develop their sporting prowess. Kenny Jacobs now wears the Springbok colours. In other words, he represents South Africa, something Prime Minister Forster swore would never happen. While few would deny it is the boycott that has brought this about, it is now this very boycott that prevents Kenny Jacobs testing his talents against the rest of the world. If a guy is from South Africa, give him the chance to prove himself. Let him run. And instead of boycott him, say, OK, he's from South Africa. We don't want you to run with us. Or we're going to withdraw if you let the South African run. I mean, uh, I don't think there's the right thing to do to boycott us. I don't want to be uncomplimentary, but I do think that Kenny Jacobs is thinking with his running shoes. To him, this is a wonderful opportunity. He mixes with people he'd never otherwise mix with. He gets his name in the papers, his picture. He appears on TV. And to him, it is something good. But uh, the changes that are taking place are all taking place within the context of apartheid. On your marks, set. You would have noticed, for instance, uh, on the track that uh, when you see athletes competing together, there's very little mixing outside uh, the actual competition. There's really no warmth about it. You don't see athletes sitting together on the arena and passing the time of day uh, as you'd find in other athletic events. And it is definitely not the way in which sport is conducted in South Africa, not throughout. Well, to be honest, that's not an unfamiliar situation in the United Kingdom in certain sports. As many South Africans pointed out to me, you have racial prejudice in Britain too. But uh, what you don't have in the UK or anywhere else, you do not have laws to reinforce and uh, to put in writing. And, and therefore, laws that uh, compel you to implement uh, discrimination, to make prejudice uh, decent, to even make uh, prejudice and discrimination a sort of law-abiding thing, because you are doing what the law says you must do. Whatever the shortcomings in athletics and boxing, South African cricket, its administrators will tell you, has more than made up for the way they once treated Basil D'Oliveira. <laughs> 6 30 on a fresh Johannesburg morning. Among the regular joggers are two cricketers who work very closely together Alvin Kalicharan, who comes from the West Indies, and Dr. Ali Baka, an ex Springbok captain and now managing director of the Transvaal Cricket Council. Their mutual interest is a coaching program that tries to reach all races in South Africa. Nowadays, Kalicharan lives in Birmingham, plays for Warwickshire, and when the English cricket season is over, comes to South Africa not only to coach, but to play for Transvaal. Quite a few British cricketers do the same. You see, the present agreement amongst international cricketing countries is that while official teams cannot play South Africa, individual cricketers should be allowed to practice their profession. Since there is still a singular lack of black faces in first-class cricket, Khalid Charan's presence in South Africa has been a useful asset for the authorities. But he's come in for a lot of stick too, particularly since he has agreed to be called, in South African terminology, an honorary white. 
This enables him to live while in South Africa in Johannesburg's exclusive northern suburbs, a whites only area. I don't take it as something, a feather in my cap. I just treat myself as a normal human being to, you know, live in the surroundings and to play my, prof to play my profession, which is playing cricket. Do you ever wonder what would be the situation if, for instance, you became a South African citizen? Up to now, I haven't given that a thought, really. In the meantime, I'm just enjoying the privileges, and I'm, uh, well, the privileges, I mean, I mean, the friends of me in this country who are helping to make my stay as happy as possible. And restaurants, and cinemas, and things like that? Uh, yeah, um, when I went back after my first season in South Africa, I spoke to my friends about the country and everything, and even told them the embarrassment to face twice about uh, being thrown out of a hamburger bar. And then one night I went to the Rosebank Hotel, and I've been thrown out of there too. So um, I've made the decisions of coming to this country, and I've got to accept the, 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 the social way. Did it make you angry at the time? No, it didn't. I was wrong to go there. Such acceptance gets neither support nor respect from most black South African cricketers. Indeed, it was in cricket that the authorities were to be confronted by one of their most persuasive critics, Hassan Hawa. There have been changes over the last eight, ten years, I suppose. The changes have once been for the wrong reasons, and therefore it's completely artificial. Uh, the changes have been so that the overseas people would accept South Africa back into the international community. I believe the change should be because they believe that all people are sportsmen. Hassan Ha is president of the national cricketing organization that will have nothing to do with its government-approved counterpart. Instead, it defiantly aligns itself with SACOS, the South African Council of Sport that fiercely opposes the government's present sports policy. SACOS and its supporters argue that the government sports body still practice multiracial sports. In other words, a system where sport is divided except at the top administrative level into white, black, coloured and Indian organisations. While SACOS claims it pursues a policy of non-racial sport. Administratively, a single organisation recognising no distinction of race. But the government say, well, what you asked us for was a multiracial sports policy. And we've given you that, and yet still you uh, are grumbling. And indeed we are. But they're also saying, as for the SACOS philosophy of non-racial sport, well, you've got that too. Because all our sports clubs are allowed to have mixed membership. To learn firsthand what SACOS's view on this was, I went to their headquarters, situated in Durban's busy Indian quarter, in a small insurance office. Manikam Patha until recently the General Secretary of SACOS thinks the idea that because you simply give clubs the freedom to integrate they automatically will is absurd. We cannot have that for the simple reason we have 387 laws, apartheid laws which has an effect on black and white relationship in this country. Only if those apartheid laws are removed it is possible for us to have a non-racial sports structure in this country. To prove their good faith therefore the sports authorities required something dramatic. And in the Sri Lankan cricket team, they felt they'd found it. An unofficial rebel team, maybe, but the first black side to ever play the South African Springboks. Cricketing history had been made, they claimed. Unfortunately, though, it didn't pull the spectators, as cricket, the Sri Lankan tour, was not a success. Wretched shot there by Rana Singer. Head was up. Got himself into an awful mess. It's particularly noticeable how badly across the line he was playing. 106 for four, facing a deficit of 381. Rodney Hartman, 702 Sports at Newland. But politically, it was a masterstroke. It captured the world's attention like no newspaper advert had ever done. That in South Africa, black and white play sport together, or at least against each other, happily and amicably. To carry it off required a high degree of organisational skill, many secret dealings and not a few bent truths, a task ably handled by the president of the South African Cricket Union, Joe Paminski. Interviewed by Rand Daily Mail reporter Armin Akalwaya, he was asked if this hadn't been done to disrupt international cricket in retaliation for South Africa's continued isolation. 
Well, that's an unfair criticism and one which seems to be freely bandied about by those who wish to discredit the efforts of the South African Cricket Union. The South African Cricket Union have made it absolutely clear and gave notice to the international community when we were in England in July and in the year previous to say that uh, it is absolutely essential that cricket in this country is promoted and fostered in the most effective way and uh, to the extent that we have been isolated from international competition for so long one of the ways of doing that is for us to have cricketers to this country. Naturally, payment of money goes with it uh, to encourage players to play in South Africa. Quite a few members of South Africa's cricketing establishment feel uncomfortable about this attempt to buy themselves back into international competition. But with an average payment of £25,000 each, it was an offer that certain Sri Lankan cricketers found difficult to refuse. After all, it was more than they could expect to otherwise earn in a lifetime of cricket. They come and see the way and how people in Sri Lanka live, then they will not speak. Then they will say, certainly, they are trying to make a living. I had to feed my family. I had to live at home to give them a uh, nice living. And uh, I'm not going to please the whole world. I got to please myself first. Like you say, always charity begins at home. Charity doesn't begin round around the world. Tony Apatha is both manager and a player for the Sri Lankan team. If you tell me a sportsman who is being sports for fun, I'll call him a liar because today the name of sport is money. Can you just come back to you know, your original statement where you said that you are coming here to uh, see for yourself? Have you been to places like Soweto? That's one thing that I wanted to see, but unfortunately we di I didn't get the opportunity with my team to go and see because the simple reason that uh, we had such a lot of uh, games on, 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 on the tour. Well, if the Sri Lankans didn't have the chance to see much beyond the cricket boundary, they're not alone. Investigating sports delegations have come and gone, but where they went when they were here, one sometimes wonders. It's as easy to be seduced by appearances as it is to be confused by the term multiracial sport. Standing in that splendid meeting place, the foyer of the Carlton Hotel, you can almost believe Exports Minister Pete Kornhoff when he says apartheid is dead in South Africa. But take an early morning stroll down the road to the Johannesburg railway station where there are two distinct exits and you can see that apartheid is still alive and well and thriving in South Africa. Radio today and it's Monday the 29th. And to maintain that requires an apparatus of control that impinges on sportsmen too. Neither Manakam Patha nor Hassan Hawa are allowed to own passports or to travel abroad. I have been threatened with death threats, bomb threats, the lot. And it becomes especially bad when they do this by telephone and telephone my wife or children to say that they're going to shoot me down. Uh, I can't say that we are not afraid. I am afraid personally of, of what they do because they have the powers to do so. The thing, of course, that if one believes strongly enough, then you don't allow fear to stop you. Minister responsible for sport, Dr. Herit Filyun, explained to us why certain sportsmen like Hassan Hauer can't have passports. The refusal of passport is not an indication that the government resists uh, a, a particular line in sports policy development, but rather an indication that particular individuals are considered to be uh, uh, a risk for the overall interests of the country if they were to be allowed to uh, travel abroad and do what uh, mischief they have either done in the past or are considered likely to be doing in the future. Dr. Herit Filyun is an ex-chairman of the Bruderbond, that traditionally secret organization that in the early 70s masterminded what was to become the government's multiracial sports policy. This policy was undoubtedly a response to the boycott and, some say, politically necessary in a society dominated by the sport's dedicated Africana. They say of the Africana that he has three articles of faith. The Dutch Reformed Church, the Nationalist Party and rugby. Last Christmas a new game appeared in the shops. The Springbok rugby team playing the British Lions. A bit of a sad irony in fact because these days due to the boycott it's the only way these two teams do play each other. 
But a man who is committed to changing that is Dr. Danny Craven, the godfather of South African rugby. Ask him about the boycott and you'll get a forthright answer. I think it's ridiculous myself. I think it's laughable. I think it comes from a source uh, which I have never been able to fathom because it was uh, started by South Africans virtually. Renegades from South Africa went to London and they started the anti-apartheid movements. People just followed them blindly. First of all, it was Peter Hine. I went to see Peter Hine. I found him a very nice fellow. We could talk sensibly, and he is intelligent enough to do so. But others are just doing it to vent their own feelings, to express their own antagonism and hatred towards South Africa. The Stop the 70s tour campaign led to angry confrontations both on and off the field in every town and city in Britain where the Springboks played. Success was measured not in the campaigners' ability to stop games, which they did, but in focusing attention on the issue of apartheid, especially as it affected sport. Its influence was far-reaching and sometimes unexpected. Vice-captain of the Springbok team at the time was Rhodes scholar Tommy Bedford, one of South Africa's finest players ever. I think it took about six months to let the impact really sink in. I'd hated Peter Hain on the tour. I couldn't understand what he was doing. But after the six-month recess, and I could return back to a life of normality here in South Africa, I certainly started thinking that uh, Peter Hain actually had a point. We had only one solution in South Africa, and that was adapt or die. In other words, if we wanted to play international sport, we would have to change our ways, and we'd have to change our ways quite radically. There is nothing more we can do in rugby. We've opened the doors for everybody. All that requires now is the implementation of our policy, and that is what we're busy with when we travel the country with these uh, rugby clinics. These rugby coaching sessions are commonly known as docs clinics. They take place throughout the country in such places as army camps and schools. The idea behind them is to get all races at this formative level playing rugby together. Something that, until these clinics were introduced, hadn't happened before. What's more, says Dr. Craven's critics, they still wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the pressure of the boycott. If that is the, uh, the view of some people, they don't know what they're talking about. We, I became president of the South African Rugby Board in 1955 when we had no boycotts. The moment I became president, that was one of my first objectives, is to bring the coloreds and black closer to us and to do justice to them, to give them equal opportunities. A young man who put Dr. Danny Craven's protestations to the test was Dan Watson, commonly known to his friends as Cheeky Watson. With his three brothers, he now runs his father's clothes shops. This one is in Main Street, Port Elizabeth. All the brothers have been fine rugby players in their time, but it was Cheeky, the youngest, who became a final Springbok trialist, who was all set to wear the green and gold. That is, until he joined a rugby club in Port Elizabeth's black township of New Brighton. The club, called the Kwaza Kela Rugby Union, Kwaru for short, comes under the aegis of Sakos. It is in direct opposition to Dr. Craven's rugby board. Its treasurer is Dan Kwekwe. Our association is truly non-racial in the sense that in South Africa, the authorities would love the country to play sport on multinational basis. Multina multinational basis means the colors must have a 15, the blacks of my color a 15, the white section a 15. Then they would meet on national level or on provincial level. But we are opposed to that. 
we strongly feel we must start from the base. Dan Kwekwe's club, Kwaru, which Cheeky Watson and his brothers joined, decided to go its own way, separate from Dr. Craven's rugby board. They built their own stadium, but it wasn't easy, especially when no black individual or organization is allowed by law to own the freehold of anything. At present, we have a promise of 99 years uh, at least, but that does not appeal to the people of the place. They want the title deed, because they know with the title deed, it's everything. Your money there is not buried. With the title deed document, you can borrow and make further development of the place. But with us, that is non-existent. Well, we're out of season now, Dan, but what's it like when the stands are packed and Cheeky Watson is playing? We have had two finals here in the past, 1975 and 1979. But close to 30,000 spectators, it was thrilling. The Watsons are a close family. Their inspiration is Dan Watson Sr., a man with granite strong Christian convictions. While making sure all his sons could speak Kosa, the local dialect, he also taught them to live by their religious beliefs. Not easy in apartheid South Africa. Taking my cause into rugby was a bit of a problem because you know what rugby means to the white fraternity of South Africa. And uh, I, I had to uh, approach it from a coaching angle where I started, uh, where I started coaching rugby. And for we black are, athletes? For, for black athletes. Yeah. And uh, we are suddenly realized that I can do more than just coach. Uh, once a week, I can now start participating myself. For a family who worked with and did business with blacks, this made sense. But it didn't please the rugby establishment nor the police. Especially when Cheeky, on principle, refused to apply for a pass to enter the black township. What was the reaction of uh, Danny Craven and the establishment to you joining a black club? Danny Craven said uh, I, was, I must be banned from all uh, curry cup rugby and so I was banned from Eastern Province uh, Rugby Union. After going on television and saying that I'm banned, he went to the Welsh Rugby Union and uh, he was quoted as saying in the Welsh Rugby magazine that you see rugby is multiracial in South Africa. There's a Springbok trialist playing for a black team. Meanwhile, back home, I was being told that I must be locked up immediately. If I'd been playing for a club side, nothing would have been said because there have been a few club players who have gone across and played for Quarry, played for Quarry in the interim. And uh, that has been the situation, but the big problem is that I was a final Springbok trialist. But Dr. Danny Craven's critics are not only those who champion the principle of non-racial sport. The white arm of the Dutch Reformed Church, like the government itself, still stands opposed to racial integration in state schools. And this is in a system where seven times more is spent on a white pupil's education than on a black's. Oh, you see what he does? <laughs> Mixed sport, a recent church circular says, is both undesirable and unacceptable, except in exceptional and controlled circumstances. Two of Danny Craven's most enthusiastic coaches are Ian Kirkpatrick, ex-Springbok International, and A.B. Williams, a coloured headmaster. No less than Cheeky Watson, they too feel they are fighting for a cause. Ron, in the Transvaal, there were 96 schools, schools of which 13 did not want to participate. We're talking about white schools. Yeah. It ended up one or two did not participate. The rest gave in because their parents rode the, the schools themselves. I feel that South Africa must be allowed to, to use sport to, to, to create the social and political changes, but not by being pressurized from outside like, like the Glen Eagles or the, this new Commonwealth uh, sports code in Australia. Then I must ask you, do you not think that there were a great number of changes that came about once the world of sport boycotted you? We're not going to argue on this aspect, but let us also accept that at this moment of time with Doc's Clinic, it is magic. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on.
This is the sort of uh, ground a youngster must come back to. Imagine a youngster going to a clinic organized by Dr. Craven and Kirk Patrick. <laughs> the following day, play rugby on this type of a surface, stony. It's discouraging. Did you play rugby? I played this? rugby. <laughs> My starting rugby career started here. It's where we feel the situation is not normal. Okay, but what happens to those kids? Those to the kids? Yeah, to the kids that come to the Danny Craven Week. The what kids happens when they leave? When they leave, to their... when they leave, yeah. they still continue playing the game against each other. They join up with clubs. In my federation, our boys meet. They play during the week for the schools. Over the weekend, they play for the clubs, and they are still creating that small changes to this rugby going, continuing into the social life. And I feel... Don't they go back to a black township? That is their home. Don't they, don't they go back to very much more primitive facilities? I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that every day. So I would not say to drink with you and to socialise with you? They have permission. In South Africa, no law debars a person from socialising together. Unless the club has applied for that permit. No, no, you, you can socialise. I don't need a permit in my home to socialise. And why should I only go to a hotel to socialise? Do you think it's important to socialise in a hotel or to socialise at home? At home. Just as much as Cheeky Watson, Abe Williams needs a permit to be in a black township. Because in official terminology, Abe Williams is coloured, not black. But I have to get a permit to go to their homes. You have to get a permit to what? go to their homes. No, me I never. Know. I never get a permit. I don't require any permit to go into South Africa, anywhere as far as sport is concerned. If you require a permit, maybe your mission are perhaps undercovered or so, and the government got a bit tick, that they no, present the no, things no, that... The I mean, a lot of companies have come to The government to South tells me it's law. What? To get a permit to go into a black town? I think the government is only keen to see South Africa's case being presented in an honest way overseas. And a lot of companies have come into this country under false pretensions, making films on sport and going and shooting political films. But can sport and politics be regarded as separate issues? Have they ever been? When you listen to one of their own politicians, Yap Murray, you know that he feels that Dr. Craven's efforts towards multiracial sport is like having a Trojan horse penetrating the very ramparts of the true apartheid faith. Uh, we contended that uh, if you want to get the approval of the outside world, you would have to go the whole hog. And that would not be confined to sports. It would have to extend to every sphere in, of the social life, economically and eventually politically. And we specifically use the uh, example of Rhodesia, where Ian Smith at that time had said that majority rule within 14 years, and everybody in the outside world said, no, not 14 years, they want it now. Once you start uh, on a course towards multiracial sports, you would not be able to confine it to that uh, sphere, and you would have to go the whole on. Apartheid's hardliners feel threatened by change. Dan Quakeway's fears are of a different sort. He fears the momentum of that change will soon be dissipated if South Africa can console its sporting enthusiasts with sanction-busting touring teams like next year's projected English rugby tour. Dan, what are your feelings about visiting teams coming here next year to play the Springboks? We shall be shocked to the ground if they would be disloyal. We feel as non-racial bodies that South Africa must remain isolated to learn a lesson. Is this the voice of black Africa? Not the individual sports star who wants to compete internationally, but a man responsible for sport at every level. South Africans are really <laughs> sport lovers, especially rugby. If they're isolated, they'll come to their senses. The message is let the other countries stay away until such time South Africa normalizes the position what do you mean by normalizing the position? Cut away the apathetic loss. If any sport has cut away the apartheid laws, it is soccer, say its organizers. This, they insist, is the real game of the black townships. Mention you're British in Soweto or New Brighton, and in no time at all, you'll be into a discussion about Liverpool or Spurs or Manchester United. 
My contact with South Africa's teams has been through an old friend, Jeff Wald, PRO for Soccer's Professional League. Last year, that's the 1982 season, we had over two and a half million spectators at first division and cup games only. Now, two and a half million people is more people than attend rugby, cricket, athletics, tennis, swimming combined. You always challenge me by saying if we wanted to look at sport in South Africa, we ought to look at soccer because it's the most fully integrated as well as the most popular. Yes, Do you no still question. hold to that question? Absolutely. It is the most fully integrated. Sure, we had lots of trauma and lots of drama in the beginning, but George Tarby and that crew of his that he's got down there who's running the show have done a magnificent job and it is today totally integrated. Racism is a sin. George Tarby, once a public relations manager for the United Tobacco Company, now the most senior man in South African soccer, the equivalent to Danny Craven in rugby. While his critics say he's no more than a front man for getting South Africa back into international soccer, few people doubt his skills of negotiation and diplomacy. Here at a press conference to launch the cup final, he firmly refutes certain sports writers' suggestions that there is a growing racial discord in the integrated ranks of the NPSL, Soccer's Professional League. If racism is to be even contemplated by anybody, that person has no place in the NPSL be he white or black. There is but George Tabe's problems don't stop there. The international controlling body of soccer, FIFA, is firmly maintaining its boycott of South Africa. If we're looking at it, at it from a purely sporting context, the only people who really suffer in terms of sport, and soccer in particular, are the blacks. By being out of FIFA, who do you think we're affecting? The millions of whites who, who, who never watch soccer re uh, really, but watch rugby and cricket? or the millions of blacks who go watch soccer every weekend. We're only affecting them. Last year, sharing this viewpoint, a British organized team of footballers decided to ignore the FIFA sanctions and come and play some of South Africa's recently integrated club sides. Foremost amongst those clubs was Kaiser Chiefs, whose owner and managing director is the legendary Kaiser Motung, their greatest player ever. So what happened? Well, Kaiser Chiefs, along with Soweto's other two great teams, Morocco Swallows and Orlando Pirates, refused to play the British Rebel team. What's more, without their local heroes, the local fans didn't turn up either, their passionate interest in Liverpool Spurs and Manchester United notwithstanding. The world should not compete against them. The reasons behind this township boycott are complex and disputed. What started as an argument over fees escalated into a question of principle. The clubs arrived at the conclusion that they were being used. In a politically sophisticated place like Soweto, you don't get away with that. Why suddenly do they want a change of heart to include us in a squad that's going to play against England when England comes around in the country to play here? All of a sudden, they have a change of heart. But politically, we are still denied the rights to, 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 to be here. Right on, bro. <laughs> what there is no dispute about is that the tour was an act of massive misjudgment by George Tabe and his soccer administrators. It was also a slap in the face for the sponsors, South African breweries, those ever-ready sanction busters with their seemingly inexhaustible funds. Why was it boycotted, though? A man well placed to no opinion in the townships is Soweto GP and politician Dr. Ntato Matlana, a boxing and soccer fan himself. Here was a group of very enthusiastic but totally misguided young sportsmen from all over the world, Argentina, Great Britain and so on, who came here because they were told that soccer was the most integrated sport of all. White South Africa really thought that the general black public would go in for sport at all costs, at any cost. And when the soccer tour flopped, they just couldn't understand. We blacks are saying that what we cannot tolerate is the falsehoods that have been spread overseas about how normal South African sport has become. We would like to see South African sportsmen say openly that they have problems with their government, that they cannot normalize sport because of the government's racist policies. If they said that and then asked us for our help, and the help of the outside world to normalize sport and asked us to play sport 
in the, on the understanding that it is abnormal, that we're all working to normalize it, they'd find us very cooperative. I feel the same way that uh, I, I don't think South Africa is ready to get back internationally at this stage, at this point in time, because uh, truly speaking, there's quite a lot that uh, we have to put right before we can go internationally sports-wise. Now, Kaiser Matong is first and foremost a sportsman, not a politician. He has every reason for wanting his team, Kaiser Chiefs, to get international experience. We are only non-racial, on, on professional level. But as far as soccer, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the majority of soccer is concerned, we're not non-racial yet. Kaiser Chiefs are a rich club, a very rich club in fact. Certainly rich enough to have their own club premises and ground. But they don't, because government legislation on land ownership for blacks prevents this. So they practice here at Johannesburg's Portuguese club. Kaiser Chiefs club secretary, Jabulani Mahlangu. The government, the government as it is now, is owning all the grounds, right? They're all controlled by the government, irrespective of the fact whether Rand Stadium, Eddie's Park or anywhere, but they're all owned by the government. And anybody who runs them must toe the line. And you have a, you have a, a stadium in Soweto. Yeah. And you have your team from Soweto, but you can't use the stadium. We can't use the stadium. Maryland Stadium, we can't use it. We wanted to lease it when they came out with this 99-year-old lease. We thought, oh, Christ, here's an opportunity now. Let's go out there and get these guys and talk to these guys and see whether they can't lease. We, we can't lease that stadium for 99 years. And it was a flat no. Reasons, no reasons. But if Kaiser Chiefs, the premier football club in South Africa, can't own its own premises, there are also some places where it can't play either. The Rand Stadium is Johannesburg's main venue for soccer. But the city council have decreed that if two predominantly black teams are playing each other, they can't use it. As a result, it is now boycotted by the professional league. The city council is losing nearly £100,000 a year and prestige soccer games in white Johannesburg are played in the spanking new rugby stadium of Ellis Park. Well, township cynics haven't been slow to point out that the Transvaal Rugby Union, who owns Ellis Park, had to have something better than rugby to pay back the £20 million it borrowed to build it. And there's only one answer to that. The cup final. And a Weezer Kaiser Chiefs, the pride of South African football, playing Durban's African Wanderers. Chiefs in yellow, African Wanderers in red. In no time, we see what these predominantly black teams are famous for, individual ball skill. One thing you can learn on the dusty patches of waste ground in the townships. Now Sikwani, Nicodemus Sikwani, going down the left-hand side. Mason Shalengwe, Chiefs again, Lapour, finding Redebi again. Redebi, all in a good run. And the chance it must be. One nil to Kaiser Chiefs. And even the crowd controllers with their quirts go wild. For the purist, this will seem a little short on teamwork and strategy. But for the spectators here today, it is more than compensated for by the delightful touches of individual skill. If such artistry impresses, what about the crowd behaviour? If this is South African Cup fever, I would certainly swap it for what we witness at, say, our present England-Scotland games. OK, so in their exuberance, the crowd spills over onto the pitch. But on or off the pitch, there's no violence. 
except perhaps from the controllers. Surely this is what good sport is about, yet regrettably is so often lacking these days. And well touched away, but it must be again. And Martin once more pulls it out. And this time he's there. A second goal to Chiefs, and it looks as if there's no stopping them now. Where else in the world you do see scenes like this? Chiefs fans on the field, the security trying to stop them, trying to get them on. Well, there we are. A decisive win for Kaiser Chiefs and a great game of football. <laughs> Caught up in the excitement of this moment, it's so easy to forget all those other things we've experienced during these few weeks we've spent here in South Africa. But if you go with the intent of lifting a few stones, rather than just visit, you cannot ignore what you see. Who the hell cares about what the problems were now? I mean, they overcome and everything went according to time, according to schedule. Magic. Magic. I really would love to be able to say to Jeff Wald, you're right, there are no problems now. The enthusiasm, the incredibly high standards, and indeed the moves towards integration. There is so much to recommend in South African sport. But if the world's sporting fraternity demanded that both opportunity and competition be fair and equal for all, then sadly, I have to say, they haven't achieved that yet. And it's difficult to see how they can under their present policy. Black sportsmen may be given special exemptions to the laws of apartheid. But it's through these laws that other blacks, many millions of them, are being forcibly transported to so-called homelands, losing the right to even be citizens of the country that they've helped to create. As a sportsman, it's not my brief to talk of these wider issues. But I cannot find it in my heart to ignore those who do. Men who know firsthand the day-to-day -day realities of their country. Bishop Desmond Tutu of the South African Council of Churches. I don't think you can ever have normal sport in the kind of society we have, a, a totally abnormal society. What has the fact that a few people are able to play soccer together or run together done for the life of, say, the migrant black worker who has to live in a single-sex hostel? What has it done for over two million blacks who have been uprooted uh, from their original homes and dumped in what we regard as dumping grounds as if they were rubbish? I mean, the whole policy of apartheid uh, thrives on the fact that uh, for white people to know anything about how blacks live, they have to take an enormous amount of trouble. And as for the resettlement camps, they are out there, as it were, and I say in the outer darkness, uh, and people are out of sight and therefore are out of mind. And if you ask those people, they would say that the, the, the whole sports uh, thing is very peripheral. It is a window dressing exercise on the part of uh, the authorities and they ought not to be allowed back into international competition. Arguments there may be on both sides, but it's difficult to see how the international sporting community can turn a deaf ear to that plea. The boycott was established to help and support a black majority, vastly underprivileged, without a vote and soon to be without their South African citizenship to bring about change without violence. It is they who are begging us now not to change our minds.